Section 7 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 7, Spells. Thierry found Dirk as he was passing under the arched colonnade. Prudence, he quoted, where is your prudence now? Dirk turned quickly. I had to put on a bold front. Certes, I hate that knave. But let him go now. Come with me. Thierry followed him through the college, up the dark stairway into his chamber. It was a low, arched room looking on to the garden, barely furnished, and containing only the bed, a chair, and some books on a shelf. Dirk opened the window on the sun-flushed twilight. "'The students are jealous of me because of my reputation with the doctors,' he said, smiling. "'One told me to-day I was the most learned youth in the college. And how long have we been here? But ten months.' Thierry was silent. The triumph in his companion's voice could find no echo in his heart, neither in his legitimate studies nor in his secret experiments had he been as successful as Dirk, who in ancient and modern lore, in languages, algebra, theology, oratory, had far outshone all competitors, and who had progressed dangerously in forbidden things. Thierry shook off the feeling of jealousy that possessed him, and spoke on another subject. Dirk, I saw a lady to-day, such a lady! Eh, twas in the valley, a valley, I mean, which I had never seen before. Oh, Dirk! He was leaning against the end of the bed, gazing across the dusk. Twas a lady so sweet she had— Dirk interrupted him. Certes, he cried angrily. She had grey eyes, belike, and yellow hair. Have they not always yellow hair, and a mincing mouth, and a manner of glancing sideways, and cunning words? I'll warrant me. Why, she had all this, answered Thierry, bewildered. But she was pleasant, had you but seen her, Dirk. The youth sneered. Who is she, thy lady? Jacobia of Martzburg. He took obvious pleasure in saying her name. She is a great lady, and gracious. Out on ye, exclaimed Dirk passionately. What is she to us? Have we not other matters to think of? I did not think ye so weak as to come chanting the praises of the first thing that smiles on ye. Thierry was angered. Tis not the first time. And what have I said of her? Oh, enough! Ye have lost your heart to her, I doubt not. And what use will ye be, a lovesick knave? Nay, answered Thierry hotly, you have no warrant for this speech. How should I love the lady, seeing her once? I did but say she was fair and gentle. "'Tis the first woman you have spoken of to me, in that voice. Did ye not say, such a lady? Thierry felt the blood stinging his cheeks. "'Could you have seen her?' he repeated. "'Ay, eh, had I seen her, I could tell you how much paint she wore, how tight her lace was.' Thierry interrupted. "'I'll hear no more. Art a peevish youth, knowing nothing of women. She was one of God's roses, pink and white, and we not fit to kiss her little shoes. Eh, hey, that's pure truth!' Dirk struggled for a moment with a heaving breast, and closed his teeth over a rebellious lip. Then he crossed the room, and opened the door of an inner chamber. He had obtained permission to use this apartment for his studies. The key of it he carried always with him, and only he and Thierry had ever entered it. In silence, lighting a lamp, and placing it on the window-sill, he beckoned Thierry to follow him. It was a dismal room. Piled against the walls were the books Dirk had brought with him, and on the open hearth some dead charred sticks lay scattered. See, said Dirk. He drew from a dark corner a roughly carved wooden figure some inches high. I wrought this to-day, and if I know the spells all right, 
there is one will pay for his insolence. Thierry took the figure in his hand. "'Tis Joris of Thuringa. Dirk nodded somberly. The room was thick with unhealthy odours, and a close, stagnant smoke seemed to hang round the roof. The lamp cast a pulsating yellow light over the dreariness, and threw strange shaped shadows from the jars and bottles standing about the floor. "'What is this Joris to you?' asked Thierry curiously. Dirk was unrolling a manuscript inscribed in Persian. "'Nothing. I would see what skill I have.' The old evil excitement seized Thierry. They had tried spells before, on cattle and dogs, but without success. His blood tingled at the thought of an enchantment potent to confound enemies. "'Light the fire,' commanded Dirk. Thierry set the image by the lamp, and poured a thick yellow fluid from one of the bottles over the dead sticks. Then he flung on a handful of grey powder. A close, dun-coloured vapour rose, and a sickly smell filled the room. Then the sticks burst suddenly into a tall and beautiful flame that sprang noiselessly up the chimney and cast a clear and unnatural glow round the chamber. Thierry drew three circles round the fire, and marked the outer one with characters taken from the manuscripts Dirk held. Dirk was looking at him as he knelt in the splendid glow of the flames, and his own heavy brows were frowning. "'Was she beautiful?' he asked abruptly. Thierry took this as an atonement for the late ill-temper, and answered pleasantly, "'Why, she was beautiful, Dirk.' and fair certes yellow hair no more of her said the youth in a kind of fierce mournfulness the legend is finished yea thierry rose from his knees and now dirk was anointing the little image of the student on the breast the eyes and mouth with a liquid poured from a purple vial then he set it within the circle round the flame "'Tis carved of ash plucked from a churchyard,' he said, "'and the ingredients of the fire are correct. "'Now, if this fails, Zerdusht lies.' "'He stepped up to the fire and addressed an invocation in Persian to the soaring flame, "'then retreated to Thierry's side. "'The whole room was glowing in the clear red light cast by the unholy fire. "'The cobweb-hung rafters, the gaunt walls, the books and jars on the bare floor were all distinctly visible, and the two could see each other, red from head to foot. Look, said Dirk with a slow smile. The image lying in the magic circle, and almost touching the flames, though not burnt or even scorched, was beginning to writhe and twist on its back like a creature in pain. Ah! Dirk showed his teeth. The Magian spell has worked. A sensation of giddiness seized Thierry. He heard something beating loud and fast in his ear, it seemed, but he knew it was his heart that thumped so up and down. The figure, horribly like Joris, with its flat hat and student's robe, was struggling to its feet and emitting little moans of agony. It cannot get out! breathed Thierry. Nay, whispered Dirk, wherefore did ye draw the circle? The flame was a column of pure fire, and it cast a glow of gold on the thing imprisoned in the ring Thierry had made. Dirk watched in an eager way, with neither fear nor compunction, but Thierry felt a wave of sickness mount to his brain. The creature was making useless endeavours to escape from the fiery glare. It groaned and fell on its face, twisted on its back, and made frantic attempts to cross the line that imprisoned it. "'Let it out,' whispered Thierry faintly. But Dirk was elate with success. "'Ye are mad,' he retorted. "'The spell works bravely.' On the end of his words came a sound, 
that caused both to wince. Even in the lurid light Dirk saw his companion pale. It was the bell of the college chapel ringing the students to the vespers. I had forgotten, muttered Dirk. We must go. It would be noticed. We cannot put the fire out, cried Thierry. Nay, we must leave it. It must burn out, answered Dirk hurriedly. The creature, after rushing round the circle in an attempt to escape, had fallen, as if exhausted with its agony, and lay quivering. We will leave him too, said Dirk unpleasantly. But Thierry had a tearing memory of a lady kneeling among green grasses and bending towards him with a dead bird in her hand, tears for it on her cheeks, a dead bird, and this. He stooped and snatched up the creature. It shrieked dismally as he touched it, and he felt the quick flame burn his fingers. Instantly the fire had sunk into ashes, and he held in his hand a mere morsel of charred wood. With a sound of disgust he flung this on the ground. "'Should have let it burn,' said Dirk, with the lamp held aloft to show him the way across the now dark chamber. "'Perchance we cannot relight it, and I have not finished with the ugly knave.' They stepped into the outer chamber, and Dirk locked the door. Thierry gasped to feel the fresher air in his nostrils, and a sense of terror clouded his brain. But Dirk was in high spirits. His eyes narrowed with excitement, his pale lips set in a hard fashion. They descended into the hall. Without a word to each other, but side by side, the two students passed into the antechamber that led into the chapel, and there they stopped. The pale rays of a candle dispersed the gathering dark and revealed a group of men standing together and conversing in whispers. "'Why do they not enter the church?' breathed Thierry with a curious sensation at his heart. "'Something has happened.' Some of the students turned and saw them. They were forced to come forward. Dirk was silent and smiling. "'Have you heard?' asked one. All were sober and subdued. "'A horrible thing,' said another. "'Joris of Thuringia is struck with a strange illness. Certes, he fell down amongst us, as if in the grip of hellfire.' The speaker crossed himself. Thierry could not answer. He felt that they were all looking at him, suspiciously, accusingly, and he trembled. "'We carried him up to his chamber,' said another. He shrieked and tore at his flesh, imploring us to keep the flames off. The priest is with him now. God guard us from unholy things.' "'Why do you say that?' demanded Thierry fiercely. "'Belike his disease was but natural.' A look passed round the students. "'I know not,' one muttered. "'It was strange.' Dirk, still smiling and silent, turned into the chapel. Thierry and the others, hushing their surmises, followed. There were candles on the altar, six feet high, and a confusion of the senses overcame Thierry in which he saw them as white angels with flaming halos coming grievingly for his destruction. A wave of fear and sorrow rushed over him. He sank on his knees on the stone floor, and fixed his eyes on the priest, whose chasuble was gleaming gold through the dimness of the incense-filled chapel. The blasphemy and mortal sin of what he had done sickened and frightened him. Was not his being here the most horrible blasphemy of all? He had no right. He had made false confessions to the priest. He had received absolution on lies. Daily he had come here, worshipping God with his lips and Satan with his heart. A groan broke from him. He bowed his beautiful face in his hands, and his shoulders shook. He thought of Joris of Thuringia, writhing in the agony caused by their unhallowed spells, 
of the eager devils crowding to their service and far away in a blinding white mist he seemed to see the ark of the saints and angels looking down on him while he fell away farther farther into unfathomable depths of darkness with an uncontrollable movement of agony he looked up and his starting eyes fell on the figure of dirk kneeling in front of him the youth's calm both horrified and soothed him there he knelt who had but a little while before been playing with devils with a face as unmoved as a sculptured saint with a placid brow quiet eyes and hands folded on his breviary he seemed to feel thierry's intense gaze for he looked swiftly round and a look of caution of warning shot under his white lids thierry's glance fell his companions were singing with uplifted faces but he could not join them the pillars with their foliated capitals oppressed him by their shadow the saints glowing in mosaic on the drums of the arches frightened him with the unforgiving look in their long eyes laude puri dominum laude nomen domini sit nomen domini benedictum ex hoc nuc eus in saculum a solicitus ad occasum laudable nomen domini the fresh young voices rose lustily the church was full of incense and music thierry rose with the hymn singing in his head and left the chapel the singers cast curious glances at him as he passed and when he reached the door he heard a patter of feet behind him and turned to see dirk at his elbow i have done with it he said hoarsely dirk's eyes were flaming do you want to make public confession he demanded breathing hard remember it is our lives to pay if they discover thierry shuddered i cannot pray i cannot stay in the church for days i have felt the blessing scorch me come upstairs said dirk as they went down the long hall they met one who was a friend of joris of thuringa dirk stopped hast come from the sick man yea is he mending thierry stared with wild eyes waiting the answer i know not said the youth he lies in a swoon and pants for breath he passed on something abruptly art afraid asked dirk quietly yea i am afraid so am not i answered dirk composedly i cannot stay here breathed thierry with agonized brows dirk bit his forefinger nay for we have but little money and know all these pendants can teach us tis time we began to lay the cornerstones of our fortune talk not to me of fortunes I have set my soul in deadly peril. I cannot pray. I cannot take the names of holy things upon my lips, said Thierry. Is this your courage? said Dirk softly. Is this your ambition, your loyalty to me? Would you run whining to a priest with a secret that is mine as well as yours? Is this, O oh noble youth, what all your dreams have faded to? Thierry groaned. I know not i know not dirk came slowly nearer is this to be the end of comradeship our league he took the other's slack hand in his and as he seldom offered or suffered a touch thierry thrilled at it as a great mark of affection and at the feel of the smooth cool fingers the fascination the temptation that this youth stood for stirred his pulses still he could not forget the stern angel he thought he had seen upon the altar and the way his tongue had refused to move when he had striven to pray belike i have gone too far to turn back he panted with questioning eyes dirk dropped his hand be of me 
or not with me, he said coldly. Surely I can't stand alone. Nay, answered Thierry, certes, I love thee. Dirk, as I have never cared for any, do I care for thee. Dirk stepped back and looked at him out of half-closed eyes. Well, do not stop to palter with talk of priests. Certainly I will be faithful to you unto death and damnation, and be you true to me. Thierry made a movement to answer, but a sudden and violent knock on the door checked him. They looked at each other, and the same swift thoughts came to each. The students had suspected, had come to take them by surprise, and the consequences. For a second, Dirk shook with suppressed wrath. "'Curse the Magian spell!' he muttered. "'Curse Zerdusht and his foul bruise, for we are trapped and undone!' Thierry sprang up and tried the inner door. "'Tis secure,' he said. He was now quite calm. "'I have the key,' Dirk laid his hand on his breast, then snatched a couple of volumes from the shelves and flung them on the table. The knock was repeated. "'Unbolt the door,' said Thierry. He seated himself at the table and opened one of the volumes. Dirk slipped the bolt. The door sprang back, and a number of students, headed by a monk bearing a crucifix, surged into the room. "'What do you want?' demanded Dirk, fronting them quietly. "'You interrupt our studies.' The priest answered sternly. There are strange and horrible accusations against you, my son, that you must disprove. What accusations? asked Dirk. His demeanor appeared to have changed as completely as Thierry's had done. He had lost his assured calm. His defiant bearing was maintained by an obvious effort, and his lips twitched with agitation. The students murmured and forced further into the room. The monk, answered, Ye are suspected of procuring the dire illness of Joris of Thuringa by spells. It is a lie, said Dirk faintly, and without conviction. But Thierry replied boldly, Upon what do you base this charge, father? The monk was ready. Upon your strange and close behavior, the two of you, upon our ignorance of whence you came, upon the suddenness of the youth's illness after words passed between him and Master Dirk. A put in one of the students eagerly, and he lapped water like a dog. I have seen a light here well into the night, said another. And why left they before the vespers were finished, demanded a third. Thierry smiled. He felt that they were discovered, but fear was far from him. These are childish accusations, he answered. Get you gone to find a better. Dirk, who had retreated behind the table, spoke now. Ye smirch us with wanton words, he said pantingly. It is a lie. Will you swear to that? asked the monk quickly. Thierry interposed. Search the chamber, my father. I warrant you have already been peering through mine. Yea, and you found? Nothing. Then you are not content, cried Dirk. The murmur of the students swelled into an angry cry. Nay, can ye not spirit away your implements if ye be wizards? Great skill do you credit us with, smiled Thierry, but on nothing you can prove nothing. Although he knew that he could never allay their suspicions, it occurred to him that it might be possible to prevent the discovery of what the locked room held, and in that case though they might have to leave the college, their lives would be safe. He snatched up the lantern and held it aloft. See you anything here? They stared round the bare walls with eager, straining eyes. One came to the table and turned over the volumes there. Seneca! He flung them down with disappointment. The priest advanced and gazed about him. Dirk stood silent and scornful. Thierry was bold to defy them all. I see no holy thing, said the monk, neither virgin, nor saint, nor prie dieu, nor holy water. Dirk's eyes flashed fiercely. Here is my breviary. 
He pointed to it on the table. One of the students cried, Where is the key? To the inner chamber. There were three or four of them about the door. Dirk, turning to see them striving with the handle, went ghastly pale and could not speak. But Thierry broke out into great wrath. The room is disused. No affair of mine or Dirk. We know nothing of it. Will you swear? asked the priest. Certes, I will swear. But the student, struggling with the door, cried out, Dirk Renswode asked for this room for his studies. I do know it, and he had the key. Dirk gave a great start. Nay, nay, he said hurriedly, I have no key. Search, my sons, said the priest. Their blood was up. Some ten or twelve had crowded into the chamber. They hurled the books off the shelves, scattered the garments out of the coffer, pulled the quilt off the bed, and turned up the mattress. Finding nothing, they turned on Dirk. He has the key about him. All eyes were now fixed on the youth, who stood a little in front of Thierry, he continuing to hold the lamp scornfully aloft to aid them in their search. The light rested on Dirk's shoulders, causing the bright silk to glitter, and flickered in his short, waving hair. There was no trace of color in his face. His brows were raised, and gathered into a hard frown. "'Have you the key of that chamber?' demanded the priest. Dirk tried to speak, but could not find his voice. He moved his head stiffly in denial. "'But answer,' insisted the monk. "'What should it avail me if I swore?' The words seemed wrenched from him. "'Would ye believe me?' His eyes were bright with hate of all of them. "'Swear on this.' The monk proffered the crucifix. Dirk did not touch it. "'I have no key,' he said. "'There is your answer,' flashed Thierry, and set the lamp on the table. The foremost student laughed. "'Search him,' he cried. "'His garments, belike he has the key in his breast.' Again Dirk gave a great start. The table was between him and his enemies. It was the only protection he had. Thierry, knowing that he must have the key upon him, saw the end, and was prepared to fight it finally. "'What are ye going to do now?' he challenged. For answer, one of them leant across the table, and seized Dirk by the arm, swinging him easily into the centre of the room. Another caught his mantle. A yell of, "'Search him!' arose from the others. Dirk bent his head in a curious manner snatched the key from inside his shirt, and flung it on the floor. Instantly they let go of him to pick it up, and he staggered back beside Thierry. "'Do not let them touch me,' he said. "'Do not let them touch me.' "'Art a coward?' answered Thierry angrily. "'Now we are utterly lost.' He thrust Dirk away as if he would abandon him, but that youth caught hold of him in desperation. Do not leave me. They will tear me to pieces. The students were rushing through the unlocked door, shouting for lights. The priest caught up the lamp and followed them. The two were left in darkness. Ye are a fool, said Thierry. With some cunning the key might have been saved. A horrid shout arose from those in the inner chamber, as they discovered the remains of the incantations. Thierry sprang to the window, Dirk after him. Thierry, gentle Thierry, take me also. Can see I am helpless? Ah, I am small and pitiful. Thierry! Thierry had one leg over the window sill. Come then, in the fiend's name, he answered. A hoarse shout told them the students had found the little image of Joris. Those still on the stairway saw them at the window. Thierry helped Dirk on to the window ledge. The night air blew hot on their faces, and they felt warm rain falling on them. There was no light anywhere. The students were yelling in a thick fury as they discovered the unholy ungents and implements. They turned suddenly and dashed to the window. Thierry swung himself by his hands, then let go. 
With a shock that jarred every nerve in his body, he landed on the balcony of the room beneath. Jump! he called up to Dirk, who still crouched on the window sill. Ah, soul of mine! Ah, I cannot! Dirk stared through the darkness in a wild endeavor to discern Thierry. I am holding out my arms. Jump! The students had knocked over the lamp, and it had checked them for the moment. But Dirk, looking back, saw the room flaring with fresh lights and seething figures pushing up to the window. He closed his eyes and leapt in the darkness. The distance was not great. Thierry half caught him. He half staggered against the balcony. A torch was thrust out of the window above them. Frenzied faces looked down. Thierry pushed Dirk roughly through the window before them, which opened on to the library, and followed. "'Now, for our lives!' he said. They ran down the dark length of the chamber and gained the stairs. The students, having guessed their design, were after them. They could hear the clatter of feet on the upper landing. How many stairs? How many before they reached the hall? Dirk tripped and fell. Thierry dragged him up. A breathless youth overtook them. Thierry, panting, turned and struck him backwards, sprawling. So they reached the hall, fled along it and out into the dark garden. A minute after, the pursuers, bearing lights and half delirious with wrath and terror, surged out of the college doors. Thierry caught Dirk's arm and they ran. Across the thick grass, crashing through the bushes, trampling down the roses, blindly through the dark till the shouts and the lights grew fainter behind them, and they could feel the trunks of trees impeding them, and so knew that they must have reached the forest. Then Thierry let go of Dirk, who sank down by his side and lay sobbing in the grass. End of section 7. Recording by Molly Craig. Section 8 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 8 The Castle. Thierry spoke angrily through the dark. Little fool, we are safe enough. They think the devil has carried us off. Be silent. Dirk gasped from where he lay. I'm not afraid, but spent. They have gone. A eh, said Thierry, peering about him. There was no trace of light anywhere in the murky dark, nor any sound. He put his hand out and touched the wet trunk of a tree, resting his shoulder against this, for he also was exhausted. He considered angrily the situation. Have you any money? he asked. Not one white piece. Thierry felt in his own pockets nothing. Their plight was pitiable. Their belongings were in the college, probably by now being burnt with a sprinkling of holy water. They were still close to those who would kill them upon sight, with no means of escape. Daylight must discover them if they lingered, and how to be gone before daylight. If they tried to wander in this dark, likely enough they would, but find themselves at the college gates. Thierry cursed softly. "'Little avail our enchantments now,' he commented bitterly. It was raining heavily, drumming on the leaves above them, splashing from the boughs and dripping on the grass. Dirk raised himself feebly. "'Cannot we get shelter?' he asked peevishly. "'I am all bruised, shaken, and wet. Wet!' "'Likely enough,' responded Thierry grimly. But unless the charms you know, Zerdusht's incantations and Magian spells, can avail to spirit us away, we must even stay where we are. Ah! My manuscripts, my vials and bottles, cried Dirk. I left them all. They will burn them, said Thierry. Plague, blast, and blight the thieving, spying knaves, answered Dirk fiercely. He got on to his feet and supported himself the other side of the tree. Certes, curse them all, said Thierry, if it anything helps. He felt anger, 
and hate towards the priest and his followers, who had hounded him from the college. No remorse stung him now. Their action had swung him violently back into his old mood of defiance and hard-heartedness. His one thought was neither repentance nor shame, but a hot desire to triumph over his enemies and outwit their pursuit. "'My ankle!' moaned Dirk. "'Oh, I cannot stand!' Thierry turned to where the voice came out of the blackness. "'Deafen me not with thy complaints, weakling,' he said fiercely. "'Hast behaved in a cowardly fashion to-night.' Dirk was silent before a new phase of Thierry's character. He saw that his hold on his companion had been weakened by his display of fear, his easy surrender of the key. He put out his hand round the tree, and touched the wet silk mantle. Despite the heat, Dirk was shivering. "'What shall we do?' he asked, and strove to keep his teeth from chattering. "'If we might journey to Frankfurt.' "'Why Frankfurt?' "'Certes. I know an old witch there who was friendly to Master Lucas, and she would receive us, surely. We cannot reach Frankfurt or any place without money.' How dark it is! Ugh! How it rains! I am wet to the skin! And my ankle! Thierry set his teeth. We will get there in spite of them. Are we so easily daunted? Thierry stared about him, and saw in one part of the universal darkness a small light with a misty halo about it, slowly coming nearer. A traveller, said Thierry, now shall he see us or no? Belike, he would show us on our way, whispered Dirk, if he be not from the college. Nay, he rides. They could hear now, through the monotonous noise of the rain, the sound of a horse, slowly, cautiously advancing. The light swung and flickered in a changing oval that revealed faintly a man holding it, and a horseman whose bridle he caught with the other hand. They came at a walking pace, for the path was unequal and slippery, and the illumination afforded by the lantern feeble at best. The horseman and his attendant were now quite close. The light showed the overgrown path they came upon, the wet foliage either side, and the slanting silver rain. Thierry stepped out before them. Sir, he said. Know you of any habitation other than the town of Baal? The rider was wrapped in a mantle to his chin, and wore a pointed felt hat. He looked sharply under this at his questioner. My own, he said, and halted his horse, a third of a league from here. At first he had seemed fearful of robbers, for his hand had sought the knife in his belt. But now he took it away and stared curiously, attracted by the student's dress and the obvious beauty of the young man who was looking straight at him with dark, challenging eyes. "'We should be indebted for your hospitality, even the shelter of your barns,' said Thierry. The horseman's glance travelled to Dirk, shivering in his silk. "'Clerks, from the college?' he questioned. "'Yea.' answered Thierry. We were, but I sorely wounded one in a fight and fled. My comrade chose to follow me. The stranger touched up his horse. Certes, you may come with me. I wot there is room enow. The light held by the servant showed a muddy, twisting path, the shining wet trunks, the glistening leaves either side the great brown horse steaming and passive with his bright scarlet trappings and his rider muffled in a mantle to the chin. Dirk looked at man and horse quickly in silence. Thierry spoke. It is an ill night to be abroad. I have been in town, answered the stranger, buying silks for my lady. And you? So you killed a man? He is not dead, answered Thierry but we shall never return to the college. The horseman had a soft and curiously pleasing voice. He spoke as if he cared nothing what he said or how he was answered. Where will you go? he asked. 
to frankfort said thierry the emperor is there now though he leaves for rome within the year they say remarked the horseman and the empress have you seen the empress thierry put back the boughs that trailed across the path no he said of what town are you courtraig the empress was there a year ago and did you not see her one of the wonders of the world they say the empress i have heard of her said dirk speaking for the first time but sir we go not to frankfort to see the empress likely ye do not answered the horseman and was silent they cleared the wood and were crossing a sloping space of grass the rain full in their faces then they again struck a well-worn path now leading upwards among scattered rocks as they must wait for the horse to get a foothold on the slippery stones for the servant to go ahead and cast the lantern light across the blackness their progress was slow but neither of the three spoke until they halted before a gate in a high wall that appeared to rise up suddenly before them out of the night the servant handed the lantern to his master and clanged the bell that hung beside the gate thierry could see by the massive size of the buttress that flanked the entrance that it was a large castle the knight concealed from him the dwelling certainly of some great noble the gates were opened by two men carrying lights the horseman rode through the two students at his heels tell my lady he said to one of the men that i bring two who desire her hospitality he turned and spoke over his shoulder to thierry i am the steward here my lady is very gentle-hearted they crossed a courtyard and found themselves before the square door of the donjon dirk looked at thierry but he kept his eyes lowered and was markedly silent their guide dismounted gave the reins to one of the valets who hung about the door and commanded them to follow him the door opened straight on to a large chamber the entire size of the donjon it was lit by torches stuck into the wall and fastened by iron clamps a number of men stood or sat about some in livery of bright golden colored and blue cloth others in armor or hunting attire one or two were pilgrims with the cockle shells round their hats the steward passed through this company who saluted him with but little attention to his companions and ascended a flight of stairs set in the wall at the far end these were steep damp and gloomy ill lit by a lamp placed in the niche of the one narrow deep-set window dirk shuddered in his soaked clothes the steward was unfastening his mantle it left trails of wet on the stone steps thierry marked it he knew not why at the top of the stairs they paused on a small stone landing who is your lady asked thierry jacobia of martzburg the emperor's ward answered the steward he had taken off his mantle and his hat and showed himself to be young and dark plainly dressed in a suit of deep rose color with high boots spurred and a short sword in his belt as he opened the door dirk whispered to thierry it is the lady ye met to-day to-day breathed thierry yea it is the lady they entered by a little door and stepped into an immense chamber the great size of the place was emphasized by the bareness of it and the dim shifting light that fell from the circles of candles hanging from the roof facing them in the opposite wall was a high arched window faintly seen in the shadows to the left a huge fireplace with a domed top meeting the wooden supports of the lofty beamed roof beside this a small door stood open on a flight of steps and beyond were two windows deep set and furnished with stone seats the brick walls were hung with tapestries of a dull purple and gold color the beams of the ceiling painted at the far end was a table and in the center of the hearth lay a slender white boarhound asleep 
So vast was the chamber, and so filled with shadows, that it seemed as if empty, save for the dog. But Thierry, after a second, discerned the figures of two ladies in the farthest window seat. The steward crossed to them, and the students followed. One lady sat back in the niche seat, her feet on the stone ledge, her arm along the window sill. She wore a brown dress shot with gold thread, and behind her and along the seat hung and lay draperies of blue and purple. On her lap rested a small grey cat, asleep. The other lady sat along the floor on cushions of crimson and yellow. Her green dress was twisted tight about her feet, and she stitched a scarlet lily on a piece of red samite. "'This is the Chatelaine,' said the steward. The lady in the window-seat turned her head. It was Jacobia of Martzburg, as Thierry had known since his eyes first rested on her. And this is my wife, Sibylla. Both women looked at the strangers. "'These are your guests until tomorrow, my lady,' said the steward. Jacobia leant forward. "'Oh!' she exclaimed, and flushed faintly. "'Why, you are welcome!' Thierry found it hard to speak. He cursed the chance that had made him beholden to her hospitality. "'We are leaving the college,' he answered, not looking at her, and for to-night could find no shelter. "'Meeting them, I brought them here,' added the steward. "'You did well, Sebastian, surely,' answered Jacobia. "'Will it please you to sit, sirs?' It seemed that she would leave it at that, with neither question nor comment. But Sibylla, the steward's wife, looked up smiling from her embroidery. "'Now wherefore left you the college, on foot, on a wet night?' she said. "'I killed a man, or nearly,' answered Thierry curtly. Jacobia looked at her steward. "'Are they not wet, Sebastian?' "'I am well enough,' said Thierry quickly. He unclasped his mantle. "'Certes, under this I am dry.' "'That am not I,' cried Dirk. At the sound of his voice both women looked at him. He stood apart from the others, and his great eyes were fixed on Jacobia. "'The rain has cut me to the skin,' he said, and Thierry crimsoned for shame at his complaining tone. "'It is true.' answered Jacobia courteously. "'Sebastian, will you not take the gentle clerk to a chamber? We have enough empty, I wot, and give him another habit?' "'Mine are too large,' said the steward, in his indifferent voice. "'The youth will fall with an ague,' remarked his wife. "'Give him something, Sebastian. I warrant he will not quarrel about the fit.' Sebastian turned to the open door beside the fireplace. "'Follow him, fair sir,' said Jacobia gently. Dirk bent his head and ascended the stairs after the steward. The chatelaine pulled a red bell rope that hung close to her, and a page in gold and blue livery came after a while. She gave him instructions in a low voice. He picked up Thierry's wet mantle, set him a carved chair, and left. Thierry seated himself. He was alone with the two women, and they were silent, not looking at him. A sense of distraction, of uneasiness, was over him. He wished that he was anywhere but here, sitting a dumb suppliant in this woman's presence. Furtively he observed her, her clinging gown, her little velvet shoes beneath the hem of it, her long white hands resting on the soft grey fur of the cat on her knee, her yellow hair knotted on her neck, and her lovely, meek face. Then he noticed the steward's wife, Sibylla. She was pale, of a type not greatly admired or belauded, but gorgeous, perhaps, to the taste of some. Her russet red hair was splendid in its gleam through the gold net that confined it. Her mouth was a beautiful shape and color, but her brows were too thick, her skin too pale, and her blue eyes over bright and hard. Thierry's glance came back to Jacobia. His pride rose that she did not speak to him, 
but sat there idle as if she had forgotten him. Words rose to his lips, but he checked them and was mute, flushing now and then as she moved in her place, and still did not speak. Presently the steward returned and took his place on a chair between Thierry and his wife, for no reason save that it happened to be there, it seemed. He played with the tagged laces on his sleeves and said nothing. The mysterious atmosphere of the place stole over Thierry with a sense of the portentous. He felt that something was brooding over these quiet people who did not speak to each other, something intangible yet horrible. He clasped his hands together and stared at Jacobia. Sebastian spoke at last. You go to Frankfurt? Yea, answered Thierry. We also, soon. Do we not, Sebastian? said Jacobia. You will go to the court? said Thierry. I am the Emperor's ward, she answered. Again there was silence. Only the sound of the silk drawn through the Samite as Sibylla stitched the red lily. Her husband was watching her. Thierry, glancing at him, saw his face fully for the first time, and was half startled. It was a passionate face, in marked contrast with his voice, a dark face with a high arched nose and long black eyes, a strange face. "'How quiet the castle is to-night,' said Jacobia. Her voice seemed to faint beneath the weight of the stillness. "'There is noise enough below,' answered Sebastian, "'but we cannot hear it.' The page returned, carrying a salver bearing tall glasses of wine, which he offered to Thierry, then to the steward. Thierry felt the green glass cold to his fingers, and shuddered. Was that sense of something awful impending, only matter of his own mind, stored of late with terrible images? What was the matter with these people? Jacobia had seemed so different this afternoon. He tasted the wine. It burnt and stung his lips, his tongue, and sent the blood to his face. It still rains, said Jacobia. She put her hand out of the open window and brought it back wet. But it is hot, said Sibylla. Once more the heavy silence. The page took back the glasses and left the room. Then the place beside the fireplace was pushed open, and Dirk entered softly into the mute company. End of section 8. Recording by Molly Craig. Section 9 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1. Chapter 9. Sebastian. He wore a flame-colored mantle that hung about him in heavy folds, and under that a tight yellow doublet. His hair drooped smoothly. There was a bright color in his face, and his eyes sparkled. Ye are merry, he mocked, glancing round him. Will you that I play or sing? He looked in his direct burning way at Jacobia, and she answered hastily, Certes, with all my heart, the air is hot and thick to-night. Dirk laughed, and Thierry stared at him, bewildered. So utterly had his demeanour changed. He was gay now, radiant. He leant against the wall in the centre of them, and glanced from one silent face to another. I can play rarely, he smiled. Jacobia took an instrument from among the cushions in the window seat. It was red, with a heart-shaped body, a long neck, and three strings. You can play this? she asked in a half-frightened manner. Eh! Dirk came forward and took it. I will sing you a fine tune, surely. I will sing you the tune of a foolish lady, he smiled. His shadow was heavy on the wall behind him. The dark purple hues of the tapestry threw into brilliant relief the flame hues of his robe and the clear pale color of his strange face. He held the instrument across his knees and commenced playing on it with the long bow Jacobia had given him. An irregular quick melody arose, harsh and jeering. 
After he had played a while, he began to sing, but in a chant under his breath, so that the quality of his voice was not heard. He sang strange, meaningless words at first. The four listening sat very still. Only Sibylla had picked up her sewing, and her fingers rose and fell steadily as the bodkin glittered over the red lily. Thierry hid his face in his hands. He hated the place the woman quietly sewing, the dark-faced man beside him. He even hated the image of Jacobia, that he saw, as clearly as if he looked at her brightly before him. Dirk broke into a little doggerel rhythm, every word of which was hard and clear. The Turkess in my fine spun hair was brought to me from Barbarere. My pointed shield is rouge and ver where mullets three shine royally. Now if he guessed he need not wait in poor estate, but on his breast wear all my state and be my maid. For sick for very love am I, my heart is weak to kiss his cheek, but he is low and I am high, I cannot speak for I am weak. Jacobia put the cat among the cushions and rose. She had a curious set smile on her lips. Do you call that the rhyme of a foolish lady? she asked. Ay, for if she had offered her love, surely it had not been refused, answered Dirk, dragging the bow across the strings. You think so? said Jacobia, in a shrinking tone. Mark you. She was a rich lady, smiled Dirk, and fair enough, and young, and gentle and he was poor, so I think. If she had not been so foolish, she might have been his second wife. At these words Thierry looked up. He saw Jacobia standing in a bewildered fashion, as if she knew not whether to go or stay, and in her eyes an unmistakable look of amazement and horror. The rhyme said nothing of the first wife, remarked Sibylla, without looking up from the red lily. The rhyme says very little, answered Dirk. It is an old story. The squire had a wife, but if the lady had told her love belike, he had found himself a widower. Jacobia touched the steward's wife on the shoulder. Dear heart, she said, I am weary, very weary, with doing naught, and it is late, and the place strange to-night, at least. She gave a trembling smile. I feel it strange so good even sibylla rose jacobia's lips touched her on the forehead the steward watched them jacobia the taller of the two stooping to kiss his wife thierry got to his feet the chatelaine raised her head and looked toward him to-morrow i will bid you godspeed sire her blue eyes glazed aside at Dirk, who had moved to the door by the fireplace, and held it open for her. She looked back at Thierry, then round in silence, and colored swiftly. Sibylla glanced at the sand clock against the wall. Yea, it is near midnight. I will come with you. She put her arm around Jacobia's waist, and smiled backwards over her shoulder at Thierry. So they went the sound of their garments on the stairs making a faint, soft noise. The little cat rose from her cushions, stretched herself, and followed them. Sebastian picked up the red silk lily that his wife had flung down on the cushions. The candles were guttering to the iron sockets, making the light in the chamber still dimmer, the corners still more deeply obscured with waving shadows. "'You know your chamber,' said the steward to Dirk. "'You will find me here in the morning. Good night.' "'Good night,' said Thierry heavily. Dirk smiled, and threw himself into the vacated window-seat. The steward crossed the room to the door by which they had entered. He did not look back, though both were watching him. The door closed after him violently, and they were alone in the vast darkening hall. "'This is fine hospitality.' sneered Dirk. Is there none to light us to our chamber? Thierry walked to and fro with an irregular, agitated step. 
"'What was that song of yours?' he asked. "'What did you mean? "'What ails this place and these people? "'She never looked at me.' "'Dirk pulled at the strings of the instrument he still held. "'They emitted little wailing sounds. "'She is pretty, your Chatelaine,' he said. "'I did not think to see her so soon. "'You love her, or you might love her.' Ye mock and sneer at me, answered Thierry hotly, because she is a great dame. I do not love her. And yet... And yet, goaded Dirk, if our arts can do anything for us, could they not, if I wished it, some day get this lady for me? You shall never have her, said Dirk, biting his under lip. Thierry turned on him violently. You cannot tell. Of what use to serve evil for naught? Ye have done with remorse, belike, mocked Dirk. Ye have ceased to long for priests and holy water. Eh, said Thierry recklessly, I shall not falter again. I will take these means, any means. To attain her? Dirk got up from the window seat and rose to his full height. Thierry gave him a sick look. I will not bandy taunts with you. I must sleep a little. They have given us the first chamber ye come to, ascending those stairs, answered Dirk quietly. There is a lamp, and the door is set open. Good night. You will not come? asked Thierry sullenly. Nay, I will sleep here. Why? You are strange tonight. Dirk smiled unpleasantly. There is a reason, a good reason. Get to bed. Thierry left him without an answer, and closed the door upon him. When he had gone, a great change swept over Dirk's face. A look of agony, of distraction, contorted his proud features. He paced softly here and there, twisting his hands together and lifting his eyes blindly to the painted ceiling. Half the candles had flickered out. The others smoked and flared in the sockets. The rain dripping on the window sill without made an insistent sound. Dirk paused before the vast, bare hearth. He shall never have her, he said in a low, steady voice, as if he saw and argued with some personage facing him. No, you will prevent it. Have I not served you well? Ever since I left the convent? Did you not promise me great power, as the black letters of the forbidden books swam before my eyes? Did I not hear you whispering, whispering? He turned about, as though following a movement in the person he spoke to, and shivered. I will keep my comrade. Do you hear me? Did you send me here to prevent it? They seem to know you were at my elbow tonight. Hush! One comes! The door at the far end of the chamber was slowly opened. A man stepped in and cautiously closed it. A little cry of triumph rose to Dirk's lips, but he repressed it and gave a glance into the pulsating shadows as if he communicated with some mysterious companion. It was Sebastian who had entered. He looked swiftly round and, seeing Dirk, came towards him. In the steward's hand was a little cresset lamp. The clear heart-shaped flame illuminated his dark face and his pink habit. His eyes looked over this light in a burning way at Dirk. So, you are not abed, he said. There was more than the aimless comment in his tone, an expectation and excitement. You came to find me, answered Dirk. Why? Sebastian set the lamp on the little bracket by the window. He put his hand to his neck, loosening his doublet, and looked away. It is very hot, he said in a low voice. I cannot rest. I feel to-night as I have never felt. I think the cause is with you. What you said has distracted me. He turned his head. Who are you? What did you mean? You know answered Dirk, what I am, a poor student from Baal College, and in your heart you know what I meant. Sebastian stared at him a moment. God! 
but how could you discern even if it be true you a stranger but now i think of it belike there is reason in it certes she has shown me favour dirk smiled tis a rich lady her husband would be a noble think of it what ye put into me cried sebastian in a distracted voice that i should talk thus to a prating boy but the thought clings and burns and surely ye are wise dirk still leaning against the wall smoothed the arras with delicate fingers surely i am wise well skilled in difficult sciences am i and quick to see and understand take this for your hospitality sir steward watch your mistress sebastian put his hand to his head i have a wife dirk laughed will she live for ever sebastian looked at him and stammered as if some sudden sight of terror seared his eyes there there is witchcraft in this your meaning think of it flashed dirk remember it ye get no more from me the steward stood quite still gazing at him i think that i have lost my wits to-night he said in a low voice i do not know what i came down to you for nor whence come these strange thoughts dirk nodded his head a small slow smile trembled on the corners of his lips perchance i shall see you in frankfurt sir steward sebastian caught at the words with eagerness yea i go there with my lady he stopped blankly as yet said dirk i know neither my dwelling there nor the name i shall assume but you if i need to i shall find you at the emperor's court yea answered sebastian then reluctantly what should you want with me will it not be you who may need me smiled dirk i who have to-night put thoughts into your brain that you will not forget sebastian turned about quickly and caught up the crescent lamp i will see you before you go he whispered horror in his face yea on the morrow i shall desire more speech with you like a man afraid in terror of himself filled with a dread of his companion sebastian the pure flame of the lamp quivering with the shaking of his hand crossed the long chamber and left by the door through which he had entered dirk gave a half suppressed shiver of excitement the candles had mostly burnt out the hall seemed monstrous in the gusty straggling light he crept to the window the rain had ceased and he looked out on a hot starless darkness disturbed by no sound he shivered again closed the window and flung himself along the cushions in the niched seat lying there where jacobia had sat he thought of her she was more present to his mind than all the crowded incidents of the past day there were her trembling passionate emotions her modest secrets that she guarded delicately it was his intention to tear open this tabernacle to wrench from her her treasures and scatter them among blood and ruin he meant to bring her to utter destruction not her body perhaps but her soul and this because she had interfered with the one being on earth he cared about thierry not because he hated her for herself how beautiful she is he said aloud almost tenderly the last candle fluttered up and sank out dirk lying luxuriously among the cushions looked into the complete blackness with half-closed eyes how beautiful he repeated he felt he could have loved her himself he thought of her now lying in her white bed her hair unbound he wished himself kneeling beside her caressing those yellow locks a desire possessed him to touch her curls her soft cheek to have her hand in his and hear her laugh surely she was a sweet thing 
made to be loved. Yet the power that had brought him here tonight had made plain that if he did not take the chance of her destruction set in his way, she would win Thierry from him forever. He had made the first move. In the dark face of Sebastian, the steward, he had seen the beginning of the end. But thinking of her, he felt the tears come to his eyes. Suddenly he fell into weary weeping, thinking of her, and sobbed sadly, face downwards on the cushion. Presently he laughed at himself for his tears, and drying them fell asleep and woke from blank dreamlessness to hear his name ringing in his ears. He sat up in the window-seat. His eyes were hot with his late tears. The misty blue light of dawn that he found about him hurt them. He shrank from this light that came in a clear shaft through the arched window, and crouching away from it saw Thierry standing close to him. "'Dirk, we must go now.' I cannot stay any longer in this place. Dirk, leaning his head against the cushions, said nothing, impressed anew with his friend's beauty. How fine and fair a thing Thierry's face was in the colorless early light, in hue and line splendid, in expression wild and pained. I could not sleep much, continued Thierry. I do not want to see them, her, again. Not like this. Get up, Dirk. Why did you not come to bed? I wanted your company. Things were haunting me. Mostly her face, breathed Dirk. Eh, said Thierry somberly. Mostly her face. Dirk considered. He reflected that he had no desire to meet Sebastian again. He had said all he wished to. Let us go, he assented. His one regret was that he should not see again the delicate face crowned with the yellow hair. He rose from the seat and shook out his borrowed flame-colored mantle. Then he closed his tired eyes as he stood, for a very exquisite sensation rushed over him. Nothing had come between him and his friend. Thierry, of his own choice, had roused him, wanting him. They were to go forth together alone. End of section 9. Recording by Molly Craig. Section 10 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1. Chapter 10. The Saint. They were wandering through the forest in an endeavor to find the high road. The sun, nearly at its full strength, dazzled through the pines and traced figures of gold on the path they followed. Thierry was silent. They were hungry, without money or any hope of procuring any, fatigued with the rough walking through the heat, and also, it seemed, lost. These facts were ever present to his mind. Also, every step was taking him farther away from Jacobia of Martzburg and he longed to see her again to make her notice him speak to him yet of his own desire he had left her castle ungraciously these things held him bitterly silent but dirk though he was pale and weary kept a light joyous heart he had trust in the master he was serving the forest grew up the base of the mountain chain and after a while walking steadily they came out upon a gorge some landslip had torn, uprooting trees and hurling rocks aside over this bare space harshly cleared, water rippled and dripped, finding its way through fern-grown rocks and boulders until it fell into a little stream that ran across the open space of grass and was lost in the shadow of the trees. By the side of it, on the pleasant stretch of grass, a small white horse was browsing, and a man sat near, on one of the uprooted pines. The two students paused and contemplated him. He was a monk in a blue-gray habit. His face was infinitely sweet, with his hands clasped in his lap and his head a little raised as he gazed with large, peaceful eyes through the shifting fir boughs to the blue sky beyond them. "'Of what use is he?' said Thierry bitterly. Since the church had hurled him out, 
the devil was gaining such sure possession of his soul that he loathed all things holy. Nay, said Dirk with a little smile, we will speak to him. The monk, hearing their voices, looked round and fixed on them a calm, smiling gaze. Dominus de ad nobis suam pacem, he said. Dirk replied instantly, et vitam aeternam, amen. The monk rose and stood in a courteous, humble position. Can you put us on the high road, my father? asked Dirk. Surely. The monk glanced at the weary face of his questioner. I am myself travelling from town to town, my son, and know this country well. Will you not rest a while? Eh! Dirk came down the slope and flung himself along the grass. Thierry, half sullen, followed. Ye are both weary and in lack of food, said the monk gently. Praise be to the angels that I have wherewithal to aid ye. He opened one of the leather bags resting against the fallen tree, took out a loaf, a knife, and a cup, cut the bread, and gave them a portion each. He then filled the cup from the clear, dripping water. They disdained thanks for such miserable fare, and ate in silence. Thierry, when he had finished, asked for the remainder of the loaf, and devoured that. Dirk was satisfied with his allowance, but he drank greedily of the beautiful water. "'You have come from Baal? asked the monk. Dirk nodded. "'And we go to Frankfurt.' "'A long way,' said the monk cheerfully, "'and on foot, but a pleasant journey, certes.' "'Who are you, my father?' asked Thierry abruptly. "'I saw you in Courtraig, surely.' "'I am Ambrose of Menthon,' answered the monk, "'and I have preached in Courtraig to the glory of God.' Both students knew the name of St. Ambrose. Thierry flushed uneasily. "'What do you hear, father?' he asked. "'I thought you were in Rome.' "'I have returned,' replied the saint humbly. "'It came to me that I could serve Christus. He crossed himself. Better here. If God his angel will it, I desire to build a monastery up yonder, above the snow.' He pointed through the trees towards the mountains, his eyes that were blue-gray, the color of his habit, sparkled softly. A house to God his glory, he murmured, in the whiteness of the snows. That is my intent. How will you attain it, holy sir? questioned Thierry. St. Ambrose did not seem to notice the mocking tone. I have, he said, already considerable monies. I beg in the great castles, and they are generous to God, his poor servant. We, my brethren and I, have sold some land. I return to them now with much gold. Dio gratias. As he spoke, there was such a pure sweetness in his fair face that Thierry turned away, abashed. But Dirk, lying on his side and pulling up the grass, answered, Are you not afraid of robbers, my father? The saint smiled. Nay, God, his money, is sacred even unto the evil doer. Surely I fear nothing. There is much wickedness in the heart of man, said Dirk, and he also smiled. Judge with charity, answered Ambrose of Menthon. There is also much goodness. You speak, my son, with seeming bitterness, which showeth a soul not yet at peace. The wages of the world are worthless, but God giveth immortality. He rose and began fastening the saddlebags on the pony. As his back was turned, Thierry and Dirk exchanged a quick look. The little procession started through the pine forest. Ambrose of Menthon, erect, spare, walking lightly with untroubled face, and leading the white pony burdened with the saddlebags containing the gold. Thierry, somber, silent, striding beside him, and Dirk a little behind in his flame-colored mantle, his eyes bright in a weary face. And so they came towards evening, on to the road, and saw in a valley beneath them a little town. All three halted. The Angelus was ringing. The sound came sweetly up the valley. St. Ambrose sank on his knees and bowed his head. The other two fell back among the trees. Well, whispered Dirk, it is our chance, frowned Thierry in the same tone. I have been thinking of it all day. 
I also. There is much money. We could get it without blood? Surely, but if need be, even that. Their eyes met. In the pleasant green shade they saw each other's excited faces. It is God his money, murmured Thierry. What matter for that, if the devil be stronger? Hush, the Angelus ends. Now we join him. They sank on their knees, to rise as the saint got to his feet and glanced about him. At the edge of the wood they joined him and looked down at the town below. Now we can find our way, said Dirk in a firm, suddenly changed voice. Ambrose of Menthon considered him over the little white pony. Will you not bear me company into the town? he asked wistfully. He did not notice that Thierry had slipped behind him. Dirk's eyes flashed in a signal to his companion. We will into the town, he said, but without thy company, Sir Saint. Now! Thierry flung his mantle from behind and twisted it tightly over the monk's head and face, causing him to stagger backwards. Dirk rushed, seized his thin hands, and strapped them together with the leather belt he had just loosened from his waist, and between them they dragged him into the trees. "'My ears are weary of thy tedious talk,' said Thierry viciously, "'my eyes of thy sickly face.' They took the straps from the pony and bound their victim to a tree. It was an easy matter, for he made no resistance, and no sound came from under the mantle twisted over his face. Having seen to it that he was securely fastened, the two returned to the pony, and examined their plunder. In one bag there were parchments, books, and a knotted rope. In the other numerous little linen sacks of varying sizes. These they turned out upon the grass, and swiftly unfastened the strings. Gold! each one filled with gold, fine shining coins with the head of the emperor glittering on them. Dirk retied the sacks and replaced them in the saddlebags. Neither of them had seen so much gold together before. Because of it, they were silent and a little trembling. Thierry, as he heard the good yellow money chink together, felt his last qualms go. For the first time since he had entered into league with the spirits of evil, he had plain evidence it was a fine thing to have the devil on his side. A stupefying pleasure and exultation came over him. He did not doubt that Satan had sent this saintly man their way, and he was grateful. To find himself possessed of this amount of money was a greater delight than any he had known. Even a more delightful thing than seeing Jacobia of Martzburg lean across the stream towards him. As they reloaded the pony, managing as best they might without the straps, Dirk fell to laughing. "'I will get my mantle,' said Thierry. He went up to Ambrose of Menthon, telling himself he was not afraid of meeting the saint's eyes, and unwound the heavy mantle from his head. The saint sank together like the dead. Dirk still laughed, mounted on the white pony, flourishing a stick. "'The fellow has swooned,' said Thierry, bewildered. "'Well,' answered Dirk over his shoulder, "'you can bring the straps, which we need, surely.' Thierry unfastened the monk and laid his slack body on the grass. As he did so, he saw that the grey habit was stained with blood. There was wet blood, too, on the straps. "'Now what is this?' he cried and bent over the unconscious man to see where he was wounded. His searching hand came upon cold iron under the rough robe. Ambrose of Menthon wore a girdle lined with sharp points, that at every movement must have been torture, and that, at their brutal binding of him, had entered his flesh with an agony unbearable. "'Be quick!' urged Dirk. Thierry joined him. "'What shall we do with that man?' he said awkwardly. His blood was burning, leaping. "'Tis a case for the angels, not for us,' answered Dirk. "'But if ye feel tenderly, and certainly he was pleasant to us, we can tell in the town that we found him. Dio gratias!' He mocked the saintly, low, calm voice. But Thierry did not laugh. A splendid yellow sunset was shimmering in their eyes as they came slowly down into the valley, and passed through the white street of the little town. They visited the hostel, 
fed the white pony there, and recounted how they had seen a monk in the wood they had just traversed, whether unconscious in prayer or for want of breath they had not the leisure to examine. Then they went on their way, eschewing by common consent this time, the accommodation of the homely inn, and taking with them a basket of the best food the town afforded. Clearing the scattered cottages, they gained the heights again and paused on the grassy borders of a mighty wood that spread either side of the high road. There they spread a banquet very different from the saints' poor repast. They had yellow wine, red wine, baked meats, cakes, jellies, a heron, and a basket of grapes, all bought with the gold Ambrose of Menthon had toiled to collect to build God's house amid the snows. Arranging these things on the soft grass, they sat in the pleasant shade, luxuriously, and laughed at each other over their food. Their master had proved worth serving. They toasted him in the wine bought with God his money, and made merry over it. They did not mention Ambrose of Menthon. A troop of white mountain goats driven by a shepherd boy went past. They were the only living things they saw. Dirk watched them going towards the town. Then he said, The Chatelaine, Jacobia of Martzburg, he broke off. Do you remember the first night we met? What we say in the mirror? A woman, was it not? Her face, have you forgotten it? Nay, answered Thierry, suddenly somber. Dirk, turned to look at him closely. It was not Jacobia, was it? It was utterly different, said Thierry. No, she was not Jacobia. He propped a musing face on his hand and stared down at the grass. Dirk did not speak again, and after a while of silence Thierry slept. With a start he woke, but lay without moving, his eyes closed. Someone was singing, and it was so beautiful that he feared to move lest it should be in his dreams only that he heard it. A woman's voice, and she sang loudly and clearly, in a passion of joyous gaiety. Her notes mounted like birds flying up a mountain, then sank like snowflakes softly descending. After a while the wordless song died away, and Thierry sat up, quivering in a maze of joy. "'Who is that?' he called his eager eyes searching the twilight. No one, nothing but the insignificant figure of Dirk, who sat at the edge of the wood gazing at the stars. I dreamt it, said Thierry bitterly, and cursed his waking. End of section 10. Recording by Molly Craig. Section 11 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1. Chapter 11. The Witch In a back street of the city of Frankfurt stood an old one-storied house, placed a little apart from the others, and surrounded by a beautiful garden. Here lived Natalie, a woman more than suspected of being a witch, but of such outward, quiet, and secretive ways that there never had been the slightest excuse for even those most convinced of her real character to interfere with her. She was from the East, Syria, Egypt, or Persia. No one could remember her first coming to Frankfurt, nor how she had become possessed of the house where she dwelt. Her means of livelihood were also a mystery. It was guessed that she made complexion washes and dyes supplied secretly to the great court ladies. It was believed that she sold love potions, perhaps worse. It was known that in some way she made money, for though generally clothed in rags, she had been seen wearing very splendid garments and rich jewels. Also, it was rumored by those living near that strange sounds of revelry had on occasion arisen from her high-walled garden, as if a great banquet were given, and dark-robed guests had been seen to enter her narrow door. That garden was empty now, and a great stillness lay over the witch's house. The hot midsummer sun glowed in the rose-bushes that surrounded it. Red roses, 
all of them, and large and beautiful. The windows of the great room at the back of the house had their shutters closed so that only a few squares of light fell through the latticework, and the room was in shadow. It was a barely furnished chamber with an open-tiled hearth on which stood a number of bronze and copper bowls and drinking vessels. In the low window seats were cushions of rich eastern embroidery, hanging on the walls hideous distorted masks made of wood and painted fantastically, some short curved swords and a parchment calendar. Before this stood Dirk, marking with a red pencil a day in the row of dates. This done, he stepped back, stared at the calendar, and frowned, sucking the red pencil. He was attired in a grave suit of black and wearing a sober cap that almost concealed his hair. He held himself very erect, and the firm set of his mouth emphasized the prominent jaw and chin. As he stood there, deep in thought, Thierry entered, nodded at him, and crossed to the window. He also was dressed in dull, straight garments, but they could not obscure the glowing brown beauty of his face. Dirk looked at him with eyes that sparkled affection. "'I am making a name in Frankfurt,' he said. "Eh," hey, answered Thierry, not returning his glance. "'I have heard you spoken of by those who have attended your lectures.' They said your doctrines touched infidelity. Nevertheless, they come, smiled Dirk. I do not play for a safe reputation. Otherwise, should I be here, living in a place of evil name? I do not think, replied Thierry, that any go so far as to guess the real nature of your studies, nor what it is you pursue. And he also smiled, but grimly. "'Every man in Frankfurt is not priest-beridden,' said Dirk quickly. "'They would not meddle with me just because I do not preach the laws of the church. "'I teach my scholars rhetoric, logic, and philosophy. "'They are well pleased.' "'Today I disclosed to them Procopius,' he continued, "'and propounded a hundred propositions out of Priscianus. "'Should improve their Latin. "'There were some nobles from court.' One submitted that my teaching was heretical, asked if I was a Gnostic or an Arian, said I should be condemned by the Council of Saragossa, as a villa was, and for as good reasons. Meanwhile, Dirk interrupted, meanwhile, we know almost all the wise woman can teach us, and are on the eve of great power. Thierry pushed wider the shutters, so that the strong sunlight fell over the knee of his dark gown. "'You, perhaps,' he said heavily, "'not I. The spirits will not listen to me. Only with great difficulty can I compel them. Well, I wot that I am bound to evil, but I wot also that it doth little for me.' At this complaint a look of apprehension came into Dirk's eyes. "'My fortune is your fortune,' he said. Nay, answered Thierry, half fiercely, it is not. You have been successful, so have not I. Old Natalie loves you, she cares nothing for me. You have already a name in Frankfurt, I have none, nor money either. St. Ambrose's gold is gone, and I live on your charity. No, no, spoke Dirk in protest but his distress was too deep and too genuine to allow of much speech. "'I am going away from here,' said Thierry firmly. Dirk gasped as if he had been wounded. "'From Frankfurt!' he ejaculated. "'Nay, from this place!' There was a little silence while the last traces of light and colour seemed to be drained from Dirk's face. "'You do not mean that,' he said at length. "'After we have been—' Oh, after all of it, you cannot mean. Thierry turned and faced the room. You need not fear that I shall break the bond that unites us, he cried. I have gone too far. Yea, and still I hope to attain by the devil's aid my desires. But I will not stay here. Where will you go? Thierry's hazel eyes again sought the crimson roses in the witch's garden. 
Today, as I wandered outside the walls, I met a hawking party. Jacobia of Martzburg was among them. They had been in Frankfurt many weeks, and so had she, yet this was the first time he had mentioned her name. She knew me, continued Thierry, and spoke to me. She asked, out of her graciousness, if I had aught to do in Frankfurt, thinking, I wot, I looked not like it. He blushed and smiled. Then she offered me a post at court. Her cousin is Chamberlain to the Queen, nay, Empress, I should say, and he will take me as his secretary. I shall accept. Are you not glad? asked Thierry with a swell in his voice. I shall be near her. "'Is that a vast consideration?' said Dirk faintly. "'That you should be near her?' "'Did you think that I had forgotten her because I spoke not?' answered Thierry. "'Also, there are chances that by your arts I may strengthen.' "'I shall lose you,' he said. Thierry was half startled by the note in his voice. "'Nay, shall I not come here, often? Are you not my comrade?' "'So you speak,' answered Dirk, his brow drawn, his lips pale even for one of his pallor. "'But you leave me. You choose another path from mine.' "'It need not grieve you that I go,' answered Thierry, half sullen, half wondering. "'I wot I am pledged deeply enough to thy master.' His eyes flashed wildly. "'Is there not sin on my soul?' Have I not awakened in the night to see St. Ambrose smile at me? Am I not outside the church and in league with hell? Dirk braced himself. Do not go, he said. There is everything before us if we stay together. If you... His words choked him, and he was silent. All your reasoning cannot stay me, answered Thierry, his hand on the door. She smiled at me, and I saw her yellow hair, and I am stifled here and useless. He opened the door and went out. Dirk sank on the brilliant gold cushions and twisted his fingers together, and after a while he heard Thierry sing as he moved about in an upper chamber. Dirk had not known him sing before, and now, as the little wordless song fell on his ears, he winced and writhed. He sings because he is going away. He sprang up and crossed to the calendar. A year ago today, he and Thierry had first met. He had marked the day with red. And now. Presently, Thierry entered again. He was no longer singing, and he had his things in a bundle on his back. I will come tomorrow and take leave of Natalie, he said or perhaps this evening, but I must see the Chamberlain now. For the second time Thierry passed out. Oh, oh, whispered Dirk, he is gone, 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 gone. Then he crept to the window and pushed the shutter wide. He leant from the window and flung out his arms with sudden passion. Satan, Satan, he shrieked, give him back to me. Everything else you have promised me for that. Do you hear me? Satan! Satan! His voice died away in a great sob. He sank back into the window seat and heard someone speak his name. Lifting his sick gaze, he saw the witch standing in the center of the floor looking at him. Dirk gave a great sigh, hunched up his shoulders and smoothed his cuffs. Then he said very quietly, looking sideways at the witch, Thierry has gone. I knew he would go, she answered in a small voice. With scant farewell, with little excuse, with small preparation, with no regret. He has gone, said Dirk, to the court at the bidding of a lady. You know her, for I have spoken of our meeting with her when we were driven forth from Baal. He closed his eyes as if he made a great effort at control. I think he is on the verge of loving her. He unclosed his eyes, full, blazing. This must be prevented. The witch shook her head. If you are wise, let him go. 
she fixed her glimmering glance on Dirk's smooth, pale face. He is neither good nor evil. His heart saith one thing, his passions another. Let him go. His courage is not equal to his desires. He would be great by any means, yet he is afraid. Let him go. He thinks to serve the devil while it lurks still in his heart. At last I will repent. In time I will repent. Let him go. All this I know, answered Dirk, his fingers clutching the gold cushions. But I want him back. He will come. He has gone too far to stay away. I want him to return forever, cried Dirk. He is my comrade. He must be with me, always. He must have none in his thoughts, save me. Natalie frowned. This is folly. The day you came here to me with the words of Master Lucas, I saw that you were to be everything, he nothing. I saw that the world would ring with your name, and that he would die unknown. She rose vehemently. I say, let him go. He will be but a clog, a drag on your progress. He is jealous of you. He is not over skillful. What can you say for him save that he is pleasant to gaze upon? Dirk slipped from the cushions and walked slowly up and down the room. What can I say for him? Tis said in three words. I love him. How little you know of me, Natalie. Though you have taught me all your wisdom, what do you know of me save that I was Master Lucas's apprentice boy? Ye came from mystery, as you should come, smiled the witch. And now Dirk seemed to smile through agony. It is a mystery. Methinks to tell it would be to be blasted as I stand. It seems so long ago, so strange, so horrible. Well, well. He put his hand to his forehead and took a turn about the room. As I sat in Master Lucas's empty house, painting, carving, reading forbidden books, I was not afraid. It seemed to me I had no soul, so why fear for that which was lost before I was born? The devil has put me here, said I, and I will serve him. He shall make me his archetype on earth and I waited for his signal to bid me forth. Men talk of Antichrist. What if I am he? So I thought. And so you shall be, breathed the witch. Dirk's great eyes glowed above his smiling lips. Could any but a demon have such thoughts? Then Thierry came, and I saw in his face that he did what I did, knew what I knew, and... and his voice faltered. I mind me how I went and watched him as he slept, and then I thought, after all, I was no demon, for I was aware that I loved him. I had terrible thoughts. If I love, I have a soul, and if I have a soul, it is damned. But he shall go with me. If I came from hell, I shall return to hell, and he shall go with me. If I am damned, he shall be damned, and go hand in hand with me into the pit. The smile faded from his face, and an intense, ardent expression took its place. He seemed almost in an ecstasy. She may make fight with me for his soul. If he love her, she might draw him to heaven with her yellow hair. Did I not long for yellow locks when I saw my bridal? I have not forgotten what I spoke of. I would say that she does not love him. Yet she may, said the witch, for he is gay and beautiful. Dirk slowly turned his darkening eyes on Natalie. She must not. The witch fondled her fingers. We can control many things, not love nor hate. Dirk pressed a swelling bosom. Her heart is in the hand of another man, and that man is her steward, ambitious, poor, and married. He came up to the witch, and, slight as he was, beside the withered eastern woman he appeared marvelously fresh, glowing, and even splendid. 
Do you understand me? he said. The witch blinked her shining eyes. I understand that there is little need of witchcraft or of black magic here. No, said Dirk. Her own love shall be her poison. She herself shall give him back to me. Dirk, Dirk, why do you make such a point of this man's return? she said, between reproach and yearning. She fondled the cold, passive, and smiling youth with her tiny hands. You are going to be great. She mouthed the words greedily. I may never have done much, but you have the key to many things. You will have the world for your footstool yet. Let him go. Dirk still smiled. No, he answered quietly. The witch shrugged her shoulders and turned away. After all, she said in a half whine, I am only the servant now. You know the words that can compel me and all my kind to obey you. So let it be. Bring your Thierry back. There is another will seek to detain him at the court, said Dirk reflectively. His old-time friend, the Margrave's son, Balthasar of Courtraig, who shines about the emperor. I saw him not long ago. He also is my enemy. Well, the devil will play them all into thy hands, smiled the witch. Dirk turned an absent look on her, and she crept away. It grew to the hour of sunset. The red light of it trembled marvelously in the red roses, and filled the low, dark chamber with a somber crimson glow. Dirk stood by the window, biting his forefinger, revolving schemes in which Jacobia, her steward, Sibylla, and Thierry were to be entangled as flies in a web. Desperate devilry and despairing human love mingled grotesquely, giving rise to thoughts dark and hideous. The clear peal of a bell roused him, and he started with remembrances of when last this sound through an empty house had broken on his thoughts, of how he had gone and found Thierry without his door. Then he left the room and sought the witch. She had disappeared. He did not doubt that the summons was for her. Not infrequently did she have hasty and secret visitors. But as she came not, he crossed the dark passage, and himself opened the door onto the slip of garden that divided the house from the cobbled street, opened it on a woman in a green hood and mantle, who stood well within the shadow of the porch. "'Whom would you see?' he asked cautiously. The stranger answered in a low voice, "'You. Are you not the young doctor who lectures publicly on many things? Constantine, they call you?' "'Yea,' said Dirk, "'I am he. I heard you today. I would speak to you.' She wore a mask that as completely concealed her face as her cloak concealed her figure. Dirk's eyes could discover nothing of her person. He held the door wide, and she stepped into the passage, breathing quickly. "'Follow after me,' smiled Dirk. He decided that the lady was Jacobia of Martzburg. End of section 11. Recording by Molly Craig.